same time as everyone else. Um, so um, I, I, may, I may do that. I, I'm still on the fence on that. Um, but anyway, it will be available to you as students in this class. And if you want to see how well you did in class, we can do a little debate or discussion, or you just want to review things that we went over in class, uh, those things will be uh, posted to a, a forum in Moodle. So all the, all the class mechanics, the testing, uh, reading schedule, all that stuff's in Moodle. So you go to classes.lanecc.edu, or just click on here, I'll just show you the main, you also go to the main page here. Most of you probably know the drill since this is winter term, but we always get new students, returning students in the middle of the term. So if you go to the main page, there's a Moodle link in the bottom right-hand corner. And you log in with your L number and PIN, the same as my lane. Hope you remember your password. Oop. Oh, <laughs> broadcast all over. Make sure to hit the tab instead of the caps lock when you're typing it in. Okay, let's try that again. Tab. Okay. Why not? I'm just going to check right here. You can see I'm taking the PE class right here in shape here. Uh, I started by running from my car right before class. <laughs> um, and you scroll down to the class here. Right here is reality, go to 16, GHL 203. Um, and we're also going off, uh, we're going out on a Comcast 23 um, and the basic cable for those of you who still have cable. Um, and there's also a live stream. So there's a live stream link down here. Uh, and this is uh, for students. Um, so there's three sections of the class is explained at the beginning of the syllabus. So this is an overview. This is the studio classroom sections in here. And uh, this class meets Tuesday, Thursday, 1 to 2.50 here in building 2 and 2.14. And then uh, we have a uh, section of students uh, watching at home or on either on cable, on the live stream, or on YouTube later on. Uh, the, the class sessions are posted later in the day on Tuesday and Thursday. <coughs> and uh, and then there's a college growth section, and I guess we haven't been able to connect to that yet. Um, but typically, you will see our Grove is over there in the corner. Uh, I'm a fellow, fellow Grover. I live down near the Berkeley New School. I get the benefits of small town living and uh, uh, being able to come up and work in the big city. Uh, it's a straight shot down the I-5. Uh, and uh, so those are the three sections, studio classroom, video and college growth. Uh, if you want to add the class, uh, see me during the break and I'll uh, get your name, L number, and clear you to add. Um, let's see, other stuff. The book should still be in the bookstore and I think they've still got copies left. It's called Theories of Reality, an Inter introduction to metaphysics uh, by yours truly. It's a um, collection of readings, you know, some commentary, uh, study questions, all that stuff. We don't have extra stuff to read that I, you know, a big giant book where I say, well, we're just going to use half of this book, or also you will um, not have uh, the problem of the instructor saying, okay, well, right here, see, this author's got it totally wrong, and here's the real scoop. So ignore that and pay attention to what I'm telling you right now. Um, let's see, classroom mechanics. So a few things uh, before I get to the requirements. Um, for, for the, well, I just briefly, the requirement for this class is it's two midterms and a final. There's also an extra credit exam you can take, which will, um, it will uh, replace either your first or second midterm score. If they're lower, if you bomb the extra credit exam, it will have no effect on your grade. So it's sort of like a duo for the extra credit exam will be made up of material uh, from, well, drawn from both the first midterm and the second midterm. And so you'll sort of have half and eight and get to revisit that material. Um, so it'll be uh, two midterms and a final. Let's come back to syllabus here. So two midterms.
bedrooms in the final, and the dates are right there in the syllabus. I haven't got them into Moodle yet, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll do that sometime later this week. But the, the dates are right there in the syllabus. First midterm, uh, the Thursday, open until Thursday, week three. You'll have about a week to take the exam. Uh, you take it in the testing lab. So even though it's in Moodle, you have to take it in Moodle in the testing lab. Uh, you can't take the test from home. And just in case you missed that, you cannot take the test from home. <laughs> and one more time, under no circumstances will you be able to take the test from home. So you can do it with an approved proctor if you're out of the area, if you're on vacation, get a business trip or whatever. They ship you over to wherever, <laughs> Afghanistan, Syria, <I> mean, <laughs> Saudi Arabia, <laughs> wherever, if you're in the military, you know, we'll, we'll make arrangements there. There's proctors are possible if you're outside the area. So we have a testing lab here on the main campus, another one in Cottage Grove, and testing facilities in Florence, and if you've got a student from Florence this term. Um, so you can take it at one of those three locations. And uh, if you need to make special arrangements, if you're out of the area, um, uh, send me a, a Moodle message and um, we'll work out arrangements. There's a, there's a link here actually for proctored testing under the exam section of the syllabus, right near the bottom. Um, speaking of exams, so they're in the testing lab. You'll have as long as you want, but you have to get out of there before they close. You have to arrive one hour before closing and all the testing policies are there and I'll link from them. <coughs> Let's see. Uh, I, have to, I might have to update this link too, now that I think of it. The testing center is now on the uh, third floor of uh, the center building in 311. Let's see. Uh, what is down here? Sending to Sam. A lot of important stuff here. Uh, here's exams. Here we go. Oh, yeah, I think this is the old link. Let's see if it redirects. Oh, it did. It's there. Okay. Um, so um, it's got pretty liberal hours, Monday through Thursday, <coughs> 9 to 7, uh, Friday, 9 to 5, and even Saturday hours, 9 to 1. Uh, you can go in there anytime the test is, is open, which will be about a week. You'll have a week to take the exam. And um, the, again, the dates, open and closing dates are in, in the syllabus. If you have something come up and you can't uh, meet the deadline, please talk to me before the deadline passes and we can work out an arrangement about uh, you taking a makeup. Uh, the drop deadline and the schedule changing uh, for purposes of refunds is this Sunday, 11.59 p.m. If you um, stick with the class, you have until the eighth week to drop. So, and I get this every term, I don't understand it, but um, students, they, they take the first midterm, maybe they bomb it, maybe they actually do okay and then like uh, I don't see a second midterm or a final, maybe they're an online student. And I just get to the end of like missing, they're missing the final, they're missing the test, no calls, no emails, no Moodle messages. I'm like, oh, F. <laughs> so, um, so, and it really it pains me to give, like if you get an F, I really want you to earn that F, right? I want you to totally <laughs> bomb all the tests and, and uh, just do miserably. Uh, and then I can feel I can give you an F with pride, but just you know, getting an F because you forgot to drop the class—that's just you know the, the ignominy of it all. It's uh, it's horrible. So and you know it's like you pay for the class and you get an F. At least um, talk to me and you know if you if you um, yeah we can um, maybe give you an incomplete. Um, try to work try to bring up your test scores early on. Also. If, if you bomb one of the tests, please come to see me. I know it's, I remember when I was an undergraduate, I remember getting a D on the exam. It was the first D I ever got. It was just a, a horrific experience. Because <laughs> most of my identity was caught up in being a student, being super smart, and uh, you know, being a, uh, having a genius level IQ and all that stuff. And I'm like, I'm super smart. And I take this astronomy test and I get a D because it's all about like spatial relationships. And I'm terrible because I get the, the moon's here, and the earth's here, and the sun's here, and, and, and uh, so, and these diagrams, I don't do well with diagrams and <coughs> graphs. Um, I got a D. And so I went and saw the instructor, you know, worked on it, and I worked really hard in the class, 
And uh, it was like, you know, it was probably 20% of my grade or something like that. And I did so well in the rest of the class, I ended up getting an A. And so, you know, that can be you too, especially with the extra credit exam, right? It'll like wipe away your first midterm score as if it never happened. But the key is not to make the same mistakes over again. <laughs> like, you know, what you want to do is if you bomb the first exam, um, which I don't recommend, but if you bomb the first exam, then the idea is the next time around you try to figure out, well, what did I do wrong? Why did I score so low? Um, and to, you know, come into the office and I can give you some help um, and try to uh, raise that, that score up. Um, office hours, um, Monday through, let's see, um, Monday through Thursday in my office, Center 410J, fourth floor of the Center Building. Um, and uh, I try to have a bunch of different times of the day. I'm available other times too. Um, the only time I think I'm not available, um, Tuesday, Thursday, 8.30 to, to 10. That's my fencing class. Oh, Kim's not helping me out. See my great fencing list. Uh, I'm taking fencing this term. So, but uh, there's lots of other times. Even in the evening time, I'll be up here late working. So uh, if you want to um, uh, set an appointment that's not those, um, that's not those hours, that's fine. And then Friday, it's just Moodle messaging. I may or may not be in my office. So uh, that's just for the online students. Um, and it's a good time. And so I may, um, I may be in my office, but I might not be. So that's just like, if you send me a message during Friday, 11 to 12, I'll get right back to you. We can have like a, like a chat session. I, the, the chat, the chat client in Moodle, last time I tried it, it was kind of buggy. You get cut off. So oh, yeah, I can show my fence. So the fencing class looks really cool. They got like a bunch of new equipment and there's a fencing club. So you don't even have to be in the class. It's Tuesday and Thursday evenings, I think about seven or something like that. Um, it's a fairly new club on campus, but they have all this cool equipment and the people are fun. So I, I'd recommend it. Oh, also um, I'm not available uh, Tuesday at 12, right before class because that's the Students for Liberty meeting it's uh, going to be right before class every Tuesday at the <coughs> new, new Center for Student Engagement. Um, I'm the faculty advisor, and uh, we have political debates and with you know primary season there. There'll be lots of discussions about partisan stuff, but mostly, mostly it's sort of more philosophical discussion, more issues-oriented uh, stuff, and not necessarily talking about candidates. Although you know when candidates are debating issues, it's in interesting to talk about those things. It's a nonpartisan club, open to all yada yada, but geared towards those that want uh, more freedom, less government, people don't like being ordered about by people in fancy hats with shiny badges or, uh, uh, you know, suits with nice titles behind their name, against their will. <laughs> Some people are in that sort of thing, but you, know, you should make those arrangements yourself. It's like the communists. I'm like, have your commune, be outside of town, we raise organic uh, cheese, you know, make organic cheese and, and and raise organic vegetables and share everything. I like there's this PSA where there's this chorus of people that say, these dungarees belong to all of us now, Tom. <laughs> Some guy that didn't save money for retirement or something, and he has to join a commune. So if, uh, so we talk about communism, a good idea, question mark, that might be a topic for, uh, of one of our sessions. My take on communism is like, a, it works really good on a small scale and if it's voluntary, that's the key thing. The thing about the, com the commies want to do is they want to take all the, 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 uh, the excess of the capitalist system, all the bounty of the market and economic freedom, and they want to use it to fund their, their uh, socialist utopian schemes, which never. <coughs> but that's a topic for another time. And if you're interested in those kind of issues, social, social economic issues, um, political issues, there's a contemporary moral issues class that's the next term. It's philosophy 205. Um, there'll be a lot. That class, I think, will just be really geared towards uh, discussion and lots of debate. Um, so that'll be same bet time, same bet channel uh, in this classroom. Uh, similar format, too. OK, um, let's see. Anything else I missed? Any questions so far? Uh, okay, so uh, maybe a little bit about the, um, the test I'll just mention briefly. Um, you know, the test will be all objective, true, false, multiple choice. Um, 
like we'll talk about arguments for it against the existence of God. So on the test, I'm not going to ask you, you know, uh, does God exist? A, most certainly he does. B, probably. C, doubtful. D, uh, definitely atheism is, atheism is where it's at, right? It's going to be something more like, um, you know, uh, St. Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God uh, stipulates that, you know, A, God is a perfect being or something like that. Or God is a being greater than which none can be conceived. That's his, his definition. And, that, and, and it might be B, God is a grand designer, which would be wrong because that's the, the teleological argument. C, God <laughs> is an uncaused cause. Nope, that's the cosmological argument. So you'll have to like identify and understand the different arguments for God's existence. Um, or you know, understand the problem of evil, but uh, and we'll talk about whether those arguments are any good in class or not. And talk about criticisms, um, but for the test, um, you, you're not going to have to. You, the idea is you come to conclusions on your own, but for the test, I'm not going to you know, require you to you know, <laughs> salute and then to support the instructor's view. Um, I just want to make sure you understand the pro and con arguments. And the idea is that that you're a rational being, you can make up your mind uh, yourself. Which is what I think philosophy is all about. Um, okay, uh, questions, concerns that have come up? Questions about course requirements? Contact the instructor. Um, so will there be some sort of study guide before the the? <coughs> yes. Uh, let's see. Do I have the? I have I have study questions at the end of each section okay. uh, in the text, and I think let's see what do I have? I have. Uh, Oh, I think I've integrated those all in the text. So, so I used to have separate study guides, and I said, well, I'll just throw those in the, I'll put those in the book so there's not like a separate paper for you to hold on to since I'm using my own book. Um, and I think there's another book where I have like sort of stuff. I think they're in the religion class. I, I have like, they're sort of split in two places because some are lecture based and some are reading based. Uh, these are all integrated with the text. So at the end of each section, you'll see questions for, uh, review. So, you know, look look at those as you go along, and then as you're, you're studying, kind of look those over again. And we'll do an in-class review as well uh, before each uh, exam. <coughs> All right, and I put my PowerPoints up here. I think I've got most of them in uh, in Moodle in the weekly outline or the early ones. I, I have PowerPoints for the first few sessions are kind of PowerPoint heavy. There's a lot of history and concepts and stuff, and later on I'm kind of showing some videos and scrawling on the digital whiteboard. And then later on, we've got some PowerPoints on the um, arguments for God's existence. Okay. Um, I like kind of doing things off the cuff sometimes. So at the beginning of class, it's like it's, I've done it a million times before. That's like, you know, I've, I, I, this is, I'm not a teleprompter sort of person. I'm not going to just read from my PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm more like Trump that way, right? I, but love him or hate him. I, I love the fact that he just, he just like spouts off, you know, whatever, and he's got, he's got talking points and he's got, you know, rhetoric and stuff like that. But it's not like he's sort of, you know, <laughs> doing this deal and reading off the teleprompter some speech that somebody else wrote. Um, and that's kind of like, that's kind of my, my uh, lecture style here. Um, but uh, I hope I, you know, I'm going to cover all the material. And just to, re to review this, just a very top link in Moodle, click on the syllabus, and you can read this over at your leisure. I'm just sort of hitting the, the high points. Um, and in class, I'll usually at the beginning, I'll go through something kind of methodically, and then we'll have some freewheeling discussion, and then I'll go back to get, you know, talking some other things. So I try to do a combination of making sure people get the basics and then doing some more kind of deep level evaluative discussion where we're arguing about these things as opposed to me just sort of lecturing up here. All right. Um, so let's, uh, let's actually do some philosophy. How are we doing? Well, also the format of the class will be taking a break, uh, like t generally speaking about 10 minutes to the hour. Sometimes it goes a little long. Sometimes I might go a little early if we have to a natural, come to a natural stopping point. But uh, about 10 minutes to the hour, we'll uh, take a break. It might take a little, a little longer break too, because there's people that want to add and uh, um, some other stuff I got to do. Maybe I can just squeeze in the ten. All right, thinking out loud here.
<laughs> okay, I'll, I'll see. I'll see if we can just do, generally speaking a ten minute break. Uh, I should just stick with ten because that's what they're used to in the studio there. Okay. <coughs> oh, um, there's a, a handout in Moodle. Let's see. Um, is there anyone who's uh, uh, registered in the theories of knowledge class also? One person. Might be some uh, overlap for you. <laughs> so um, it's tough because there's no like philosophy 101. I think I used to do like a, a telecourse, um, a sort of an online course with some video stuff. Um, this sort of a canned course is a 199, but there's no, there's no intro to philosophy here. So it's broken up into three classes. And this is something that's sort of a legacy when I got here. There's 201 is ethics, 202 is epistemology or theories of knowledge, and then the 203 is theories of reality. There's no um, assumption that you've taken another philosophy class at all, and there are no prerequisites for this class. It, and it just so happened that uh, um, whoever set up the course numbering system decided ethics was the easy one and they want to start out with it. And it actually used to be a sequence. So, um, and what would happen is people would take the ethics and they're like, that's pretty cool. And then some people would take the 202 who took the 201, but nobody could take the 202 who hadn't taken the 201. So you get a smaller class, right? And then the two, by the time you get to 203, um, you get like sort of the hardcore people are gonna take all three, um, but you have really low enrollments and there's nothing a college administrator hates more than low enrollments. So uh, eventually there's just sort of delinked and there's no, there's, no, there's no kind of academic reason to have the three courses linked. So now they're all, they're all their own deal and um, and uh, there's no prerequisites for any of the philosophy classes we have here. It's all, they're sort of all their own deal. Um, so, uh, so this is 203, but that doesn't mean that it's sort of a more advanced class or that builds on the 202 or the 201. If you're in the 202 though, there'll be some good uh, overlap and I think you'll see how each concept relates to the other. And it's really hard to talk about metaphysics without kind of sort of talking about epistemology. So. Metaphysics is the theory of reality. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. And you know, when you're asking like what's real, that you come to this question, well, how do I tell, right? How do I know? Um, or if you ask how do I know, uh, then the question is, well, you know, if I, uh, what, what can I know? What, what's the world, what, what am I able to know? And based on what I know, what is the world like? So you, they sort of play off one another. So. Sometimes philosophers call them the good old m and &E, metaphysics and epistemology. They're kind of the bread and butter of uh, philosophy. And some, some, uh, some philosophers, you know, sort of look at uh, ethics as kind of, um, I don't know, kind of soft, <laughs> soft philosophy or, or, you know, not, not as rigorous. Um, and aesthetics, if forget about it. That's, aesthetics is sort of the, that's a theory of art. That's the, the redheaded stepchild of, of philosophy, usually dealt with in the art department. Um, we'll talk about these different categories of philosophy too. Since there's no intro, I like doing a little history of philosophy in this course because it's the, where it sort of fits the best. And so the first reading you'll have is from Socrates, the father of philosophy. So, um, and just to uh, make sure you've read uh, chapter one uh, by Thursday. So um, we'll definitely get to chapter one. Uh, we might, we might even finish it. I usually don't get quite to the end. I kind of get to where Socrates is bumped off, and I think we just be right at the end of class. Um, and we don't get to talk about the categories of philosophy and some other things till uh, the next week. Uh, but um, read chapter one for this week, and uh, by next class, if you can. The apology is kind of long, but it's also, um, I think it's kind of readable. It's uh, Socrates' defense before the city-state of Athens uh, for crimes against the state, including uh, the crime of corrupting the youth. So, um, man after my own heart, <laughs> philosophically. Uh, so, let's see. Um, but also, for the first week, uh, make sure to look at this handout here. Uh, but so that the, the PowerPoint for next time is right here too. Print friendly format and uh, the PowerPoint itself. I think, unless I made a PDF. I think that's the PowerPoint. Here, this icon is PowerPoint, I can see it now, so. Um, you can get a free PowerPoint view or use Open Office or something like that. It'll display. Um, so if you click on this What is Truth handout, um, there will be some um, 
There'll be, uh, I think, at least a few questions on this handout on the, on the uh, exam. So, um, and this is just, it's, it's extremely uh, important and fundamental to the nature of philosophy um, and what philosophy is. So, um, because the 202 class isn't required for 203, I thought we'd talk a bit about, you know, the nature of truth. Um, scroll on my starboard here. So what is truth? Or to put it another way, um, you know, one question is, you know, what is, what is the thing that's true or false, right? What do, what do we mean when we say, uh, what, what does it mean for something to be true? I suppose, by the way, what, what does it mean for something? Yeah, you know, what kind of thing? What kind of things are true or false? For something to be true you know, or false. This is what we do in philosophy. It's called conceptual analysis. Throw out a question and sort of uh, hash it out, try to figure it out. Um, can you use particular examples? Think about like what you the, the, the meaning of words. Um, it's like you can look at you can sort of look up a dictionary definition. That's not always going to steer you in the right direction. Think about like it, the way you use the word truth. You know what does it mean? What does it refer to? Any any ideas? What comes to mind when you say you know, uh, the truth, or um, uh, that's no, it's really true, or I don't think that's true. The reality would actually happen. Yeah. So, um, so what is true? So we have reality. Uh, what happened, right? So, like events can be, uh, what happened. So now. Uh, we just say like reality is true. So I'm thinking about like, um, you know, what's reality? Uh, like, you know, this uh, this box of winter green uh, uh, sugar free mints. Is it is it true? <laughs> is this the sort of thing that could be true or false? Right? The 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 box of the box of mints. Or what's that? Yeah, it seems is real. Maybe, right? <laughs> the, we assume it's real. Um, but what does it mean to say, what ha, ha, you know, What does it mean to say something's true? It seems like it's a little different. Yeah. I read the, this, I like J.A. Gilbert. Uh-huh, right, right. Uh-huh. Like it was talking about like cultural relativity or cultural reality or something that you said. And it's like, you know, a hundred or so <coughs> years ago, people thought like what was true was that the sun revolved around the earth. But what uh -huh. we hold true now is the opposite. Yeah, so is that, that's an interesting question. Can something be true to you? Yeah. And it sounds like what you're talking about is like beliefs, right? Religion, yeah. Well, uh, is there a difference between... Belief. Yeah. But if you look yeah. at religion, like, um, there's a difference between believing in God and God existing, now, right? Like, I might believe in God, and maybe there isn't one. Or I might not believe in God, and maybe there is one. Right? So, but some people think about this sort of belief People say, oh, true for you and true for me. They seem to be talking about belief and not really truth. Oh, let me ask this question. Can you believe something that's not true? So how do you tell which beliefs are true for you? I mean, does that mean that it, it's a kind of a weird construction? Oh, it's true for me, true for you. But like, but it, then I ask the question, okay, I, I even know what true for you means unless it just means you believe it. But... I ask the question, okay, well, but is it true? Like true in the, the normal sense of the word, which means what? Yeah, yeah it's like sort of the facts, right? Uh, belief, um, 
you could say like appearance, like what seems to be true. How about like majority belief? If we get enough people, like you mentioned, like you know, people at one time, everybody believed that the um, earth was the center of the universe and that all the planets and the sun revolved around it. And then Galileo comes around and says, no, it's, uh, and actually this goes way back, but Galileo is the one that sort of brought it back after the, you know, the, the Greeks had this idea, then Aristotle screwed everything up. And we'll talk about Aristotle later on at some point. Um, and Aristotle actually considered whether the earth was spinning like a top on its axis and going around the sun. And he says, well, that, that's not really going to work. Everything will like, sort of fly off through, you know, so there's some <coughs> centrifugal force, right? Um, and then uh, in the Middle Ages, Aristotle was kind of canonized as a Christian saint, and um, that was sort of the way things were for uh, a long time. So people didn't really think, I mean, some people thought the earth was flat, but, but generally speaking, they just thought the sun was the center, or the earth was the center of the universe, and the sun and all the planets went around it. And then Galileo and Copernicus Copernicus and some other people figured out that it was, uh, you know, the, the, that the Earth actually did spin like a top and go around it, uh, the sun. But did, did reality change? I asked that, what, what, when people believed that, were their beliefs true? Well, they were true then. <laughs> what does that mean, except for they believed it? Or they really, really, really believed it? Or... They can't be blamed for believing it. It seems weird to say that it was true. Like, that just because they believed it. Like, if one person believes something, that doesn't make it true, right? Like, if I if I believe I have, like, last night I was transferring some, some, some money around in my bank accounts, right? If I believe I have, like, you know, $5 million in the account, and I write a check for, like, uh, $4 million, and then it, Wah, 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 you know, bounces, right? Uh, um, it, it looks like my, I have to revisit my belief, right? It seems like my <laughs> belief turned out to be false. Um, so, um, so just because I believe something doesn't mean that it's true. You might be, take an example, you, you might think you have enough money to cover like a, a debit. You go in there and buy your textbooks. You're like, holy moly, that's a lot. <laughs> oh, I think I have enough in there. You can swipe your card, you know, eh, declined, right? So you had a false belief, and and do you just like look at the, the the clerk and say, no, my belief that I have enough money in there is true for me. <laughs> it's true for me. I, I just came from philosophy class, and I learned that that whatever I believe is true for me. No, you you change your belief in accordance with reality. Um, if you if you expect reality to mold itself to your beliefs, isn't that like psychosis or something? Megalomania, uh, thought, thought to me is solipsism, uh, extreme narcissism, I'm not sure what you call it. It seems sort of bizarre to think that the world will magically conform to your belief. That's sort of like, I don't know, kids think that, right? Kid, like a, a little kid will think if they, if they cover their eyes like that, that the world disappears. <laughs> um, I don't know, thought, thoughts on this? What do you think? Am I, am, I, am, I, am I being too harsh? Am I being dogmatic? I don't know how the world works. But does it really become reality, or just but like figuratively? Is, is there certain doctrines in the law that you claim you have to abide by, it and you might not believe it, but well, that's more like force and coercion. That's like government, right? Government uh, ordering you about, telling you when to, to, you know, what to do and and what to eat, and uh, you know, uh, all the stuff, all the forms you got to fill out, right? Well, that's like if you don't, if you don't, then they're gonna f you hit you with a big fine, and if you don't pay the fine then they're going to, like, you know, seize your property. If you don't have any assets, then maybe they'll gonna eventually come out and drag you off to jail or something. So that's just, like, that's, you don't really have, have to, you don't really believe it, though. You just, like, you knuckle under. Because, like, I don't know, better than going to jail. Um, but maybe with the mass media, right, you'd have, like, people say things like, I don't know, I, let's pick an uncontroversial, uh, uncontroversial example. Hands up, don't shoot. <laughs> Never happened, right? But you say it enough, people believe it. You just like chant slogans and people believe it. Um, without doing any investigation, people just sort of repeat things. Um, 
or pick your favorite example of the thing that you think everybody around you believes that isn't true. So, um, but when you say like, you know, that, that the media manufactures reality, do you mean reality reality or do you mean reality? In scare quotes. <laughs> well, it's a fine line because you have the internet, so there's like a virtual presence reality, and then there's like going out on the street and talking to dude getting hit by a car reality. And shit, you know? Yeah, but it is, aren't those the same reality? Like I read on the internet, it says, um, I don't know. Oh, I, uh, some, um, let's see, so, uh, read Saudi Arabia uh, executed uh, some top Shia cleric. And, and then in retaliation, uh, the uh, Saudi embassy in Iran was attacked, right? It's a news story. Um, now, it may be accurate, may not be accurate. I mean, most of the, the reputable media organizations are reporting it. I, I think it's accurate. Um, it seems like that's the same thing. It's just like maybe the car hitting me on the street has more of an immediate effect. <laughs> um, but those are both part of reality. It's just that it might be, and this gets to the knowledge thing, it might be hard to figure. It might be harder to verify whether political events happened as represented in the media um, than whether there's a car coming down the street, right? So you sort of first-hand sensory experience versus second-hand, third-hand reporting. You know, maybe even not with any pictures or anything like that. You know, pictures can be faked, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted to do this uh, thing in my theories of knowledge class. I actually have a twin brother. I was going to have him stand up and, uh, uh, my identical twin brother, stand up and start giving a lecture and then uh, talk about how, well, but, but how do we really know? How, how do you know that I'm not actually Professor Baroda, but I'm his identical twin brother up here visiting for the holidays? And then I was going to come in, you know, the back of the class and say, imposter. But <laughs> the weather ruined, ruined my plan, so maybe next year. Um, but isn't there a difference between reality and reality, right? When you say we create our own reality, you don't mean like directly, right? You sort of you know, believe something and it just sort of magically happens. Maybe if you believe you can become a great singer, you can't just sort of, you, you believe that. And then you do a bunch of stuff like you practice and you know, uh, get a band together, um, you know, hire a marketing director. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever, they put out a CD, or you got to do something. So that's just like ordinarily, like you're know, pursuing a goal in a rational way and having self confidence. But you're not really creating your own reality, like it's magic. It seems like there's belief and then there's reality, and sometimes they're the same and sometimes they're different. And what the rational person will do is to conform their beliefs to their reality. So, how does this relate to the truth thing? We have sort of this idea of belief and the way things seem. Uh, Seeming, seeming, like things seem a certain way as opposed to being a certain way. Seeming, maybe. So what about truth then? What does it mean to say a thing is true? Like what kinds of things are true? If I ask this, you know, this this box of mints, it's not, is this, bo is this box of mints true or false, right? That doesn't make any sense. So what kinds of things are true or false? Yeah, so that's so what would that be? That would be, oh, and actually, that's a that's a question. So I'm not sure a question could be true or false, but maybe the answer to that question is true or false, right? So you ask a question: Does the box is the box does the box have any white on it, or is it? I don't know what this color is: aquamarine or teal. I don't know what that is. Uh, but like you say, is there white on this box? And and you could just turn that into a statement, right? The the this box has some white on it. Um, so you have things like uh, you know, what's true or false um, beliefs going back to the beliefs right beliefs statements <coughs> um, sentences uh, propositions are uh, true or false So um, uh, I'll just put this, um, depending on what 
on whether uh, what so so we have a belief like um, I have a uh, million dollars in my bank account or maybe a statement uh, I have a million dollars in my bank account right it's the same thing except for it's could be uttered uh, statements could be uttered they could be written down uh, maybe I'm bragging on my blog that I have a, a, a million dollars in my bank account a sentence is just a, a statement in a particular language so you know uh, so if it could, it could be in French or something like that, like the same sentence. Or if I say, you know, uh, my brother plays the guitar, um, I'd say, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Julie joue de la guitare, right? It's the same statement, just in different, different languages. A proposition is like the thing that's true or false that's expressed in belief statements, sentences, and propositions, uh, sentences, and uh, I'll just say it's belief statements and sentences. Uh, proposition is sort of like an abstract entity that's the thing that's true or false. Um, this is all, all in the handouts, but the, so what kinds of things can be true or false? Belief <coughs> statements, sentences, and propositions. Propositions, philosophers say, are there the things that are expressed by belief statements and sentences? Um, so so they're true or false depending on what? Like what makes us, what makes a belief true or false? I, no, uh, no, it's interesting you say evidence there. So is it possible that I have a bunch of evidence for my belief and it still turns out to be false? <laughs> like uh, weapons of mass destruction, right? Uh, so, um, in the, the prelude to the second Gulf War, um, every intelligence agency, uh, uh, virtually every intelligence agency, thought that Saddam had these stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction. You know, George Tenet, the CIA director, told, told uh, you know, uh, George W. Bush, it's a slam dunk. Uh, Jordan said, Saddam's got WMDs. Uh, you know, MI, what are they, MI5? The, the, the British one, they said, he's got the WMDs. Uh, <coughs> Egypt, WMDs. Everybody thought Saddam had them. And Saddam was claiming he had them and doing the saber at him. And if you look at the, like the, um, there's a Senate report on this, and basically on the WMDs. And basically the idea is Saddam had this kooky theory, he said, if, if they think I have WMDs, they're not going to invade me because everybody's going to be afraid of me. They're going to be afraid of me using my WMDs. So I'm going to make everybody think I have them when I really don't. I got like some old canister and some crap and some raw uranium and stuff, but he didn't really have it. He, he had some, but not like in like big stockpiles of usable weapons. And it turned out that was the very thing that got him invaded. So, um, so but, but at, at one time, uh, virtually everyone thought Saddam had these weapons of mass destruction. It turned out he didn't, right? So it turned out it was false. It was a false belief, but supported by a lot of evidence. Um, sometimes in a courtroom situation, right? Um, there's that thing, what is it? Uh, there's this new reality show about this um, guy who's accused of murder. What's it called? Maybe you see this. What's it called? Making a, making a murder? Any else see this thing? That's like the making of a murder. Yeah, what is it called? Making a murderer? Yeah, yeah. So I've, just, I've, I've only seen like clips of it. And so th sometimes you have a person who's like convicted and all the evidence convinced the jury that he did it and it turns out that he didn't do it, right? In reality, right? So depending on whether... Um, uh, whether I should say they, right? <coughs> whether they... Uh, uh, correspond with reality. Something to tell us about yourself there. And please do that, most important thing, <coughs> do that by uh, Thursday at 3. So uh, for students in the class here, like before class on Thursday. Because Thursday afternoon, I'll be going through my role. And anybody who you know uh, didn't post the form there is in danger of being given the boot, particularly if I have a long list of students I want to add. Enrollment seemed to be up a little bit. They were uh, 
they were depressed in the fall. They seem to be coming back. Maybe the economy is <laughs> coming up to another nosedive. Who knows? <coughs> they get enrollments go up, enrollments go down. Okay, let's get back to philosophy. Um, just to, to recap, uh, for next time, post the personal introductions form and read chapter one on uh, what is philosophy. Um, so we're talking about the nature of truth a little bit as a kind of a uh, foundational prolegomena to philosophy. It's sort of the, uh, a for you think about it as being a forward for um, the, uh, the basic axioms of philosophy. You can't really do philosophy without the correspondence theory of truth. Because what is philosophy all about? It's about the search for truth. Uh, it's about um, understanding the world as it is as opposed to how it appears to be. And so if philosophy is all about the pursuit of truth, then you have to know what truth is. And if truth is just like what you feel is right for you or whatever you believe, then it's, you know, it's not really philosophy. It's like, it's like an encounter group or um, like your therapy session, right? Or um, you know, if it's like a finding your inner self or exploring your personal beliefs, then it, it's, it's kind of like uh, something you do in a, you know, a drumming circle or something. And I, got to, I used to get together with my friends when I was in uh, Santa Maria, um, teaching at Allen Hancock College there. Kind of, you know, California, kind of, kind of like Eugene, actually, a kind of bohemian, more Santa Barbara than Santa Maria. Um, but we had this, this uh, as a, like a, a wisdom circle where we all uh, sort of like shared things and passed around like a, uh, yeah, a symbolic piece of pipe. Nobody's smoking anything. And we're just sort of uh, passing around and um, people are sharing their feelings and, and their struggles and stuff. That's not philosophy. That's, that's something else. Uh, philosophy is about the dispassionate pursuit of truth. It's about... Uh, wanting to understand the truth, even if that truth is terrible, even if you don't want to know it um, at some level, right? Uh, and the idea is that knowing the truth is better than <coughs> believing a pleasant delusion. Um, so, and it's about not just like particular truths, but about the truth about the world in general. So it's not about knowing how much money is in my bank account or why I keep on smelling this horrible burning rubber smell uh, whenever I uh, drive my car on the freeway. Right, those are there's truths about those things, um, you know, or about whether I should shave my beard or not. Yeah, you know, there's there's sort of there's truths about there's truths about those things, but then those aren't like philosophical truths. Philosophical truths are like, do I have free will? Does God exist? Uh, do I have a soul? Right, those are the things that that, that are about philosophy, strictly speaking, <coughs> philosophical beliefs. And there is you know philosophical psychology and philosophy of science, and so there's philosophy about certain fields and, and endeavors, but it's this kind of particular nitty-gritty truths about the world that aren't that interesting philosophers. Philosophers want the big picture. They want to understand the nature of reality in general, the nature of truth in general. So uh, that's what we'll be doing in this class, and we'll be looking at God and free will and the soul, life after death, meaning of life at the very end, all that fun stuff. So just to start out with, though, the correspondence theory of truth. What's true or false? Beliefs. What's a belief? It's kind of, a belief is a propositional attitude. So let me just uh, let me get a new page here. <laughs> belief is a, a, that's a mental, it's a mental representation. And represent. Let's try that. I believe is a mental representation, <coughs> um, and sometimes it's uh, 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 what's it a representation of? Well, it's of you know of a. Uh, um, I'll just. I'll just say which expresses a proposition. And then the question is, what is a proposition? A proposition is the, 
the thing, let me put this in quotes, the thing that's true or false. It's kind of an abstraction. Whatever it is that's true or false, the belief expresses it. And the idea is that a statement is a, a verbal or written expression of a proposition. Proposition. So I ran out of room. So you think about this a belief, it might not be ever expressed, right? <clears throat> you might think, uh, you know, that woman is driving me to drink. And you might never tell her or anybody else, right? It would just be this private belief you would have and never express. Maybe it wouldn't even come out in your actions, or there it might sort of affect your actions, but nobody would figure it out. It's like, you know, oh, uh, Bardell, he's got that drinking problem. I wonder what it is. And, um, and maybe you never, never met that woman, right? So <laughs> maybe there are several, right? But you would never know that belief that I have. And the belief might be true. So um, a belief is a mental thing that exists inside your brain um, or your soul if you have one. And then a statement would be like if I, you know, I write in my diary, dear diary, that woman is driving me to drink. So that would be a, a written expression, or maybe I'm like at the bar with my with my friend, and uh, I'm say, and I order another double scotch, and uh, and I say that woman's driving me to drink. Right? So those are all those all express the same proposition that this particular woman is the cause of, of my heavy drinking. Yes. So could you say truths aren't necessarily facts then? Uh, no, every every truthful statement is a factual statement, and vice versa. Now, are you suggesting that maybe, um, like, that's a statement. Now, it's either true or false. Mm -hmm. Now, it might be false. It might be, it might be that, that actually um, what's causing me, uh, maybe the cause of my drinking is that um, I, uh, I'm trying to avoid responsibility, taking responsibility for my problems, which is usually the cause of heavy drinking. Um, it could be, you know, it's po it's logically possible that that there's a predisposition or a disease called <coughs> alcoholism that makes people drink. I don't think that's true. I think it's a false statement. I think there might be a small genetic predisposition in certain people uh, to addictive behavior, but uh, generally speaking, people are looking for short-term solutions to long-term problems. So that so that the, in my example, like I mean, that woman's driving me to drink. It might be that it's false. It might be that I believe it, but it's not the way things actually are. And th that's a weird thing is like, you can have a false belief even about your own, about your own situation, even about your own beliefs, right? Like the cause of your own behavior. Like I might think um, the reason I'm an alcoholic is because of this woman, when in reality it's my own personal problems, right? Um, I've seen people, they, they say they have a bad, a str bad string of relations and they think it's like, it's a karma or God's punishing me or the stars aren't right or something like that. And that, those are all false beliefs. But the person <coughs> thinks that's what's driving her behavior when it really it's like some traumatic childhood experience that's uh, tripping them up. Yeah, so uh, um, the truth is the facts or the way the world is. And then there's our, our beliefs about the world which may or may not match up to it. Think about your beliefs or the statements you make as sort of like a map that represents the world in a certain way. And maps can be accurate, they can be inaccurate, right? They can be poorly made, they can be scrawled on a cocktail napkin, or they can be produced by satellite imagery. They can be, um, they can be outdated, right? Um, they could have been accurate at one time and then the world changes, like they put in a new, new uh, road, or I was heading off to a, um, I remember I was in Vegas and, and using the, one of the mapping, I think it was using the, um, I think it was using a map that the hotel furnished and they're doing all these constructions and I'm driving down this road and all of a sudden there's a dead end, <laughs> a bunch of bulldozers, it's like 2 a.m. I'm like, oh, where the hell am I? <laughs> Get out my phone and try to figure it out. Um, but the map was old because they were doing all this construction at the casino where I was staying, so. 
Anyway, so, so maps can be accurate or inaccurate. And the same thing, your beliefs can match up with reality, and they can be, uh, then they can not match up with reality. When your belief or your statement matches up with reality, we say that it's true. If it doesn't match up, we say that it's false. What do you think? Is that too simple? <laughs> or is that the way it is? <laughs> Truth is what is, uh, a, a falsity is what is not. Um, or at variance of, with what is. Um, and you know, what things are true or false? Well, it's the beliefs or statements, uh, sentences, if you like, propositions, if you want to be fancy. Is that is that is that is it more complicated than that? Or there, how about some counterexamples? Philosophers love to to when they, you put forth a theory, right? Usually, what happens immediately, you get five counterexamples from the audience. Oh yeah, but. What about this, or what about this case, or here's a here's a case where where it looks like your theory doesn't work. Um, those are called counter counter examples. Um, <coughs> sometimes counter arguments. The counter examples are good because you can say a counter counter example. You show a particular case where the theory doesn't hold water. Um, and sometimes you can have a counter argument. Uh, might include a counterexample, might not. But counterexamples are, are a staple in philosophy. I'm trying to think of a, can anybody think of a good counterexample? Can you think of a case where this theory of, the corresponds theory of truth doesn't work? Well, uh, more and more today, they're uh, using quantum mechanics. So mm -hmm. it uh, states that if uh, there's like variable outcomes and like you, Look at a particle; it behaves different when you're not paying attention to the particle. Right. So, how would you bring that into uh, quantum mechanics? Yeah, quantum mechanics is weird. Um, there's two interpretations of quantum mechanics. One of them says that this kind of weirdness is built into the system, and it has to, and that the, the observer is sort of part of the system. I think what I'd say about quantum mechanics yeah, and what some of the supports of correspondence theory would say, uh, would say um, there are problems with observing uh, tiny, minute particles. Like you can't, some of these particles, you can't really observe them unless you like take atoms and smash them into each other at fantastic philosophies. Going down like miles of these like tubes and pipes you know, over there in Europe at the CERN thing, you smash these atoms together, and then in a split second, they all go off, and you try to record what happens. I don't understand the details of how this works, but you basically smash these atoms together, and then look at these particles that ask for, they last for like milliseconds, nanoseconds, and try to figure out what happened. And, um, and sometimes you're, you're doing something a little smaller, and you're looking at like a radioactive, uh, um, isotope and how often it emits um, particles, but it's all, it's really hard to look at things that are really tiny without uh, affecting the experiment. It's kind of like um, trying to build, there's a, a video I'm going to show later on, this guy uses this example for something else of trying to make a Legos where you're wearing boxing gloves, right? And so I think, I think it's just a matter of the exp um, experimental. Now some people, some some people say no. The weirdness is built into the world. But I think um, if you ask the question, um, does the correspondence theory of truth work for quantum mechanics? Um, what does that assume? That your theory is correct. Yeah. Quantum mechanics isn't, is actually. Oh, just asking the question assumes. So there's two answers. Yes, it holds. No, it doesn't hold. Maybe there's sort of a, uh, a, a question, something that says it holds somewhat, right? But the question is, so, so if you ask whether the correspondence theory of truth works for quantum mechanics, you're assuming that it does or it doesn't, which assumes the correspondence theory of truth. So what yeah. about like a conditioned belief? Or this is all based off a of belief, which is a mental re representation. What if somebody gets told every day that 
Like, I was watching this movie where a little kid has a really good dog, but his dad tells him every day that dog is stupid, that dog <coughs> is stupid, that dog is stupid. Then he mm -hmm. believes, he's been conditioned to believe that the dog is stupid. Does right. that still correspond with the theory? Yeah, so I think there, you, you, like, part of reality is recognizing that people can be conditioned to believe false things. So, you know, there's lots of historical examples, right? You can be, you can be conditioned to believe you're the master race. <laughs> uh, or... Um, that you know, or that Jews are evil, or that uh, what's that? The Titanic is unsinkable, yeah. Um, or lo lots of different things. Um, there are lots of uh, you know, culture is a is a powerful force, and often the culture um, cultures even inculcate beliefs that people aren't aware of. They don't see the beliefs as being sort of even a belief; they just see it as being common sense. Um, there are lots of beliefs, lots of beliefs like that. So, um, I guess the the correspondence theory of truth would say that that it's possible to be um, brainwashed, to be deluded, to be um, to form false beliefs for all sorts of reasons. And it seems like there are even like evolutionary mechanisms which will lead us to 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 with a predisposition to form false beliefs. Um, it's just that we can become aware of those and then try to compensate. Uh, other other counterexamples. Think about like where, where like what about like God exists, right? Doesn't that sort of depend on your point of view? Does the correspondence theory work with stuff like that, like uh, God or free will or life after death? Yeah. I'll start. I'll get you first, and then you. Go ahead. So. Sorry, what was your last? So the question is: is um, really hard does yeah does um, does the correspondence theory of truth, which says you know a true statement is one which represents the world the way it actually is, um, does that work for everything? Does that work for whether or not God exists? Because some people will say, well, whether God exists or not depends on your point of view. It what, seems like it, you know, who's to say whether God exists or not? Would it matter? <laughs> Whether it's true or not to you, would that have any effect on if it was actually true or not? Oh, now, now that's, that's an interesting question, but it's kind of a separate question. Yeah. Like, one question is, is it true? The second question is, does it matter? Okay. Um, and some people have the, that view, right, that maybe there's a God, maybe there isn't. I don't really care because it doesn't really, you know, make that much difference to me now because, <coughs> uh, well, yeah, what, what good's it going to do me? Okay, well, there's a... There's a God. Well, yeah, you, you can actually make some arguments, I think, uh, why it might matter. Um, we'll get to the end of the course. Um, there's a guy, Leo Tolstoy, makes some arguments about why believing in God is like the most important thing. And then you get Bertrand Russell that says, uh, believing in God sort of a mixed bag, and it's got a big downside to it. He's an atheist, or technically an agnostic, but um, uh, a, a kind of a di dogmatic agnostic. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, it may, you know, certain truths are like, so it, it, there's an interesting thing, like certain truths. Can you think of a truth that maybe is um, certain but trivial? Like something that, that most people would say, well, um, that's something that's knowable, right? There's really, it's, uh, it's a, a truth that's, that's eminently knowable or that's, you know, <coughs> pretty much accepted that we know this is true, but it really doesn't make any difference. but it doesn't really make a difference to anyone's life if it's a fruit or a vegetable. Like right, there you go. Yeah, things. whether you classify tomatoes as fruit or as a vegetable, uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't uh, have any significance. Except for, you know, putting one over your friends and winning a debate. <laughs> I actually had this uh, with my, one of my colleagues. I uh, had, had an argument over um, whether the tomato was a fruit or a vegetable, uh, which I won. So, but apart from the little ego stroking, that doesn't make that much difference. How about something that's like maybe like iffy and difficult, like maybe it'd be a hard thing to find out and it's uncertain but might have a big impact? Like uh, is the speed of light the fastest possible speed? Yeah, I suppose long term for kind of uh, space travel or something, I don't know. Um, I think is that going to be practical to most people like today though? It seems like an abstract thing. That seems like more like um, the, the sort of like Maybe, maybe yeah, that's maybe both not not uh, iffy and insignificant. 
or at least maybe it's significant to science, but not to your average person. Yeah. Um, vaccinating children. Yeah, well, you should vaccinate your kids. It's, that's like a thing that's, like, that's very practical because you have a decision to make. And the question is, you know, do you, are you going to be spreading disease or are you going to be saving your kids from some uh, bad side effect from a vaccine? That's an important thing to know. Um, yeah, so, there, so there's a difference between like, whether something's true and whether it's significant. Um, William James, we'll talk about this in the Theories of Knowledge class, talks about um, even with, in the absence of evidence, you have the right to believe certain things if they're really important, if, they're, uh, if you have to decide right now, and if they're significant, if they have a significant impact in your life. And those are things that are sort of iffy and, and not that significant, like um, uh, I think the, the speed of light or you know, who killed JFK or something like that. It's you know, interesting to talk about, but that doesn't really have any practical impact. But how about like, do I have a soul and um, will, my, will my consciousness survive the death of my body? There's a thing which it seems like it's not sort of common sense and easy to know, but it's also like, it, I would think that would be pretty important. But I don't know, I, is there anybody, how many people would say like knowing whether there's life after death, it doesn't really that matter, matter that much. You don't really care. Oh, there's a few people, okay. Oh, does, like it might depend on like whether you can have your you know brain frozen for later reanimation, or um, you know how how much do you take care of your health? Um, <coughs> whether you focus on enjoying the here and now, or whether you see this life as Socrates did as practice for the afterlife. Do you think you feel pretty um, pretty stupid if you're like doing like Socrates practicing for death, and then you die and there's nothing? Well, you wouldn't feel stupid. You wouldn't feel anything, right? But it'd be kind of a wasted life if you're you're practicing for a performance that will never occur. But at the same time, like, that's kind of why it doesn't matter what happens after you die, because if something does happen, then you lived your life the way you did, and then you said, figure it out after you're dead if something is happening. But if nothing happens, then who really cares? You won't know you're dead. That's true, but you like, if it affects what you're doing now, you're just gonna, you might waste a bunch of time like praying to a fictitious being, Tell them you're sorry for your sins, not going out drinking and fornicating with your friends. <laughs> what, what you know, it might, might affect that. you in all kinds of ways. That you're, you think that, that because there's this afterlife waiting for you, you got to focus on that, and you ignore all the great things that you can do here in this life. And, but if nothing yeah. happens, you won't know the difference, though. That's also just a, Yeah, but it doesn't mean that your life might, might, couldn't be better if... if uh, so, so suppose, suppose there's no afterlife, right? And so after you die, you're not going to know whether there's an afterlife. But because you believe in an afterlife, you're like, well, you know, there are all these health nets and stuff like that, but I don't really care about my health because the most important thing is the afterlife. And maybe you live, you, you miss out on like 10 years of life because you're eating the double cheeseburgers and you gain a lot of weight and maybe you don't listen to your doctor because you're like, heavenly reward awaits me. This is, I will someday I will slough off this overweight motor coil and uh, uh, be in eternity with the angels singing and so on. And then maybe you spend a lot of time in church and you think about the afterlife and you don't go out there and like, you know, learn how to windsurf or whatever, do all the fun stuff. So uh, you think like it might uh, eventually, even though you wouldn't know the outcome, it might affect you in the meantime. Um, so you might, so it's not, so because otherwise like, uh, let's try a counter argument for that. Okay, so if, if it doesn't matter whether there's an afterlife, um, hmm, I don't know if that's, this is a good counter argument or not. I'm thinking like, what if, you know, well, what, what if, you know, I'd ask, would it be okay if I killed you now then? Since you could go to the afterlife, you'll be there with the angel and stuff like that. I, maybe I'd be doing you a favor. I mean, from your point of view. Um, you'd say, well, murder is wrong. I don't think it would be bad for you because God's going to send you to hell, but it'd be good for me. But then if you're wrong, you you know, you miss it. again. You miss out on a lot of stuff. So, um, so truths can be truths can be uh, they can be significant or insignificant. They can be um, easily knowable or difficult to know, and those are all like independent variables. <coughs> um, the the some people it's interesting. They don't they don't seem to care about they don't seem to care about living. The, there's a philosopher named. Uh, Camus. 
uh, pronounced Camus, it's uh, French, um, Albert Camus, Camus. <laughs> uh, and he said, the most important question in philosophy is the question of suicide. <coughs> a little digression, the question of suicide. And the idea, he, asks, he says, the most important question you ask yourself is, why don't I kill myself right now? <laughs> you think, oh, well, why would I? My life's great. I, I love my life. But the question is, what's the point uh, of it all? And, and Camus says, once you're able to answer this question, you come up with a reason, why, a reason for living, right? You come up for a reason not to kill yourself. You come up with a reason for living. And um, so it's a it's sort of interesting, uh, interesting thought. Uh, uh, if you have a, um, an explanation or what, a reason, a reason for not dying is a reason for living. I mean, that's an easy way to express it. Uh, a reason for you know, not dying is a reason for living. Maybe we'll come back to this when we talk about life after death. <laughs> it, it, it affect our attitudes too, right? Um, I remember seeing this tabloid. There was this uh, child uh, beauty queen who was uh, garroted in her basement uh, when she was like five or six years old. Um, uh, John Benet Ramsey it was back in the 90s. And um, there was like this tab tabloid heaven. I think it was a quote from the mother that said, John Benet is in heaven now, right? And you think about that, it's kind of a comforting thought, right? As opposed to, you know, you know John Benet's body is, uh, you know, uh, decomposing in a pine box, right? That's kind of depressing. Um, so you think, you think about like seeing your deceased relatives and loved ones, um, in some heavenly realm and not worrying about dying. Um, and maybe thinking there was a reason for it all, usually like God and the afterlife and the meaning of life, those things were kind of caught up together. It seems to make a difference, the, the idea that this is all there is, that it's just a one glorious accident, that's, that uh, nothing awaits you but, but the worms, that's, that's kind of gloomy and depressing. So maybe it'll make an effect on your, your <coughs> attitudes towards life as well. Okay. Um, Questions or, or disputations on the correspondence theory of truth. Like we had the quantum mechanics thing, talked about whether it mattered or not. Um, oops, uh, come back here. What, what was I looking for? This one, belief statements, sentences, or propositions are true or false, depending on whether they correspond with the reality. In other words, whether they match up describe the world the way it actually is, as opposed to contrary, contrary-wise. Uh, what about when someone says, well, I personally believe, fill in the blank. What do they mean when they say that? Opinion. Yeah, so, so aren't opinions true or false too? <laughs> They say I believe something, but I don't really have any evidence for it, or I don't think I can prove it. Usually, I don't know, I, I don't hate to psychoanalyze people. Uh, typically, when someone says this is my, just my personal belief, they're trying to like, um, sort of generate some lowered expectations. Like, don't expect me to actually uh, take pains to <coughs> research uh, and defend this belief. But I would put it out there anyway, <laughs> even though I'm not really entitled to believe it, because I don't have any proof for it. I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, so I'll say in this class, uh, I like having free will discussion, but um, this isn't really a class about your personal beliefs. This is a question about, about beliefs, and it's a question about what's true. Um, so if you want to, to, to share a belief, let's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, 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 um, a public belief. <laughs> it's because because it's not, it's the, once you share a belief, it's no longer your personal belief. So if you have personal beliefs that you don't want to open to <coughs> rational scrutiny and argumentations, then you can keep them personal, I guess. But um, for the purposes of class discussion, we're, you know, there's no sort of sacred cows or, or sacrosanct beliefs, any beliefs open to question. Um, 
So we'll be talking about non-personal beliefs. So if you slip and say, well, my personal belief is, I might ask you, well, what's your impersonal belief? Because <laughs> that's what I'm interested in. What's your impersonal belief? <coughs> I.e. your like objective, your, your belief about objective reality that we can all talk about. Um, because your personal beliefs, again, uh, uh, share them with your friends or your therapist or something like that, but they're not really a uh, proper subject matter for, for a philosophy class. All right, um, maybe I beat that to death. So, um, am I going to hear true for true for who? Uh, personal belief. I'm thinking of all these things. I'm trying to stave off like week seven. Somebody's going to say, "Yeah, but true for who?" Or uh, this is my personal belief. Um, what about God? This guy, I threw that out there a couple of times. Can you really say like, are there really just two choices? How about this? Um, There's a chapter called, Does God Exist? What are possible answers to this question? Yes? Yes or no? Yeah, it's just no. No. Uh, Was a smart athlete, alky philosophy answer a question. Answer a question with a question. Uh, what do you mean by God? Uh, now, what about the maybe? Does maybe have to do with reality? That's a yes or no question without an answer, which kind of chalks it up to the maybe category. It gets thrown in there. No one can say for sure. It's, it's well, not uh, a matter of fact. And on what basis do you believe that? Well, I mean, you can. science continues to get disproved, and religion seems to continue to get disproved because people say, this doesn't work. Theoretically, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. Science has been disproved by philosophers over and over again. Different philosophers prove each other's work incorrect and come up with a new theory or a new belief. I don't know if science has been disproved. Like, scientific theories get overturned. Sometimes they don't actually get junked all together. I mean, maybe some of the early ones, like the Earth, Air, Fire, and Water, and all that stuff we'll talk about. But, you know, the modern, like, you know, Newton, Newton just didn't get thrown in the trash heap. He just sort of got uh, modified. Yeah. You know, force equals mass times acceleration plus all the Einsteinian constant, uh, you know, plus all the stuff you have to deal with for relativity. That goes back to the world of square belief. Somebody originally thought that that was the smartest opinion in the world, that or that we were the center of the universe. Right, that yeah. So that got, that gets overturned because we realize through improvement, technology, things like that, that that got overturned. The same way that religion gets overturned with atoms and carbon and all that stuff. Carbon yeah, so, atoms. again, I wouldn't say like overturned. And uh, the religion thing is sort of a, maybe a, a complex thing. Um, but I, I would say like scientific theories get changed because there's new evidence. And it seems like it makes sense. Like, this is the way you do it in your ordinary life, right? You're, maybe you're in Christmas season, right? And, you know, when you're a little kid, maybe you believe in Santa Claus. Um, and then maybe at some point, maybe I don't know if you remember the, the point at which you realized there wasn't a Santa Claus. What? <laughs> I'll leave Bloom over there. I'm my nephew. I think he was about 10 or something. It was a slow study. Um, maybe you see like there's you know you see a, a, a Santa on a street corner and you come a block and you see another Santa on a street corner and you know this guy's got eyeglasses and um, <laughs> or maybe you see your one of your parents dressed up in a Santa suit or you know, whatever at some point you figure it out that there is no Santa Claus um, and then you change your beliefs to match up with the reality well you know humanity is sort of like this you believe in you know the uh, I don't know, evil spirits cause epilepsy, right? And now we understand neuroscience and uh, we are learning a lot of the causes of mental illness and, and uh, neurological diseases and all sorts of things that people used to attribute to invisible spirits and, and agencies. And so you know, human beings learn more about reality. They junk some of the uh, old beliefs. Um, and then later on we'll talk about is God one of those beliefs or not? Um, I'd say there's maybe, no maybe. There's no, there's this, there's no maybe in metaphysics. <laughs> I mean, there's maybe in epistemology, right? The maybe has to do with whether you know or not. But whether there is a God or there isn't, it's either one or the other. 
It can't be both, right? That's already a contradiction. God both exists and doesn't exist at the same time in the same respect. Um, this is called the law of excluded middle. And this is why you've got to have a good, good definition of God. So, like, if, if by God you mean... Um, uh, that if your de definition of God is something like God as a social construct or something, <coughs> well, then maybe you know, God exists as a social construct. But, it, but if you say, no, I mean like a spiritual being who's created the world and eternal and all-powerful and all-knowing and blah, 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 like fill in the blank, and omnipotent, omniscient, um, disembodied mind, then you, you have a definition. And you, then the question is, is there such a being or isn't there? And there's only one answer. Like, you stipulate a being of a certain sort, uh, then you ask the question whether that being exists, either the being exists or it doesn't. There's no sort of, kind of sort of exists, or it both exists and doesn't exist. Right? So um, it's either true or false. And this is the, the um, law of excluded middle. This goes back to Aristotle. And that says, every well-defined proposition, you know, well-defined, uh, maybe I'll put the word meaningful there. Uh, I have time, I have time for this. <laughs> meaningful, mean, meaningful. Uh, well defined every uh, well defined meaningful let's put it up here proposition is either true or false there is no in between and if there is an in between then it just shows there's something wrong with the definition like if you say is it rainy outside and maybe it's sort of misting or drizzling. You're like, well, I don't know. What do you mean by rain? And you say, well, by rain, I mean, and maybe you could quantify it in terms of precipitation, <coughs> precipitation per hour. You could uh, say, well, OK, just misting doesn't count, but drizzling counts. Or you might say, no, I mean like big raindrops, right? Once you find out how the person's using this word, it's kind of vague in English, they get more precise, then the statement's either true or false. And you go outside, and and either it's raining or it isn't, right? There's no sort of in-between. The in-between shows there's something wrong with the definition. And when people say, well, who's to say, they're not really talking about reality, they're talking about knowledge. Like, how do we know? So people do this with God. Either there is a God or there isn't a God, but maybe trying to figure out whether there is or not is hard to tell. So it's, it's uh, but that's a question of knowledge, it's not a question of reality. Um, okay, so that's all we have time for today. Uh, we'll start writing with uh, Socrates, the father of philosophy, on Thursday.